Hello, everyone, and warm welcome to our educational webinar series. My name is Paranush. I'm the head of education at ANT, and I'm very glad to be hosting today's session on From One Size Fits All Psychiatry to Stratified Psychiatry, uh, the use of EEG based uh, brain marker one. Our presenter today is Dr. Martin Arns, uh, who is the research director at the Brain Clinics Foundation an associate professor at Maastricht University, Faculty of Psychology and Neuroscience. His main interest is stratified uh, psychiatry and precision psychiatry for depression and ADHD, uh, as well as brain stimulation techniques such as RTMS. The session will be followed by a short relevant demo by anti-application specialist team, and we'll have uh, the Q&A session afterwards with Dr. Arns and Dr. Roman Bakrushev as the application specialist in ANT Neuro. In the course of the presentation, you're also uh, very welcome to send us your questions or even raise your hands in case you want to pose your questions on the spot and um, we can activate your microphone. Also in the beginning of the presentation, Dr. Arns will have some questions uh, from you after the introductory slides to get to know the audience better. So uh, please make sure to participate actively in the poll questions to make it more interactive. So Dr. Arns, uh, thanks a lot for being with us here today and accepting our invitation. We look forward to hearing more about your interesting approach to stratified psychiatry. All right, well, Anush, thank you very much for, uh, for the kind introduction and thanks a &T for uh, for having me and inviting me. It's always interesting to, uh, I hope, to share information and I hope that uh, the audience will find it uh, interesting as well. So indeed, today what I would like to do is, um, yeah, summarize a little bit uh, the last two decades of research we've been uh, doing. My main interest as a biological psychologist has always been uh, to use a readout of the brain uh, to thereby optimize treatments in any way we can, uh, because I'm not usually a big fan of the DSM-4, DSM-5. We know that behavior maps very poorly on brain activity, especially EEG. Uh, on the other hand, we do know that we could use uh, EEG clinically, especially in the field of psychiatry. Uh, and therefore, I want to learn a little bit of the experience uh, that we've went through over the last two decades and how it's culminated in what we currently know as said, the brain mark platform or brain marker one that I think uh, you'll see it towards the end can be used in a clinical uh, meaningful way. These are my disclosures. And before we start, I think it might be good to uh, to go over the poll questions. And I think uh, Fanoush, you can probably activate them for all the attendees. Uh, so a couple of questions that I would like to uh, know is, um, have you ever heard of stratified psychiatry? Uh, relative to uh, precision psychiatry and other, other types of um, psychiatry. Um, the second question is, do you currently use EEG or quantitative EEG to guide your treatment decisions in psychiatry? Then what is the main indication of interest? Is that mainly ADHD, depression, or other disorders? And finally, what is the main treatment modality of interest? Are you mostly uh, yeah, relying on pharmacological treatment, neuromodulation, psychological, psychedelics, or maybe other treatments. So be curious to know uh, what the full outcome will show. So I have a little bit of an impression uh, of who's listening in and maybe that I can individualize and personalize the presentation to some means. So the first poll is already ongoing um, and we have an interesting uh, result. 77% uh, voted. I'll just share the results. Um, so 50% yes, 50% no. <laughs> that's pretty and good to know. I mean, it, it's a relative new term. That's why I was curious to know how many people have heard of it. Uh, most people still think about precision psychiatry, personalized medicine. So it's good to hear that, that is half the people know the term at least. Yes. So uh, the second uh, poll question is ongoing. Let's give it 30 seconds or so. I assume I don't have to respond to it, right? Um, I don't think so. <laughs> but please comment if it's uh, not in line with your expectation. Uh, I just closed the poll and shared the results. 
Well, interesting again, almost half half, 40, uh, 47% yes, 53% no. Mm -hmm. Let's get to the third question. I give it 10 more seconds so that's uh, at least 70% uh, vote. And here are the results. So 30% ADHD, 30% uh, depression, and 40% other. It will be interesting to know what these other applications are during Canon, maybe. No. I look forward to that uh, for the Q&A, what other indications? I mean, we'll be focusing on a trans diagnostic approach uh, to EEG, uh, so ADC depression, two thirds is good to see, and uh, that will be the main focus. But of course, I think there's potential implications across disorders, uh, also to other disorders as well. And the last poll question is ongoing. What is the main treatment modality of interest? Perfect, so let's close the poll and here are the results. It seems that neuromodulation, RTMS, TDCS with 65% has the highest interest rate. And then uh, pharmacological um, measures and other has 12%. No one has voted for psychedelics or psychological uh, measures like psychotherapy. Okay, well, that's good to see. I mean, the good news is we'll try to cover all of them, all of the above. So I hope uh, to be able to, uh, to satisfy all the interests uh, that are around there. So as mentioned uh, earlier, I think uh, today what I want to focus on mostly is to give a brief rehearsal, even though most of you have heard of stratified psychiatry. I still want to provide a little bit of short background on it for those who have not been too familiar with it, but especially also not only what does the concept entail, but also more from an ethical point of view, like when can we start implementing something in practice? When is something ready for practice? Which I think is very often a forgotten question to ask. And then what we'll do is we'll focus a little bit on um, the EEG biomarkers that we've been describing over over the last two decades uh, and show you one example in this case brain marker one uh, and also demonstrate to you how extensively i think we've validated that approach uh, across disorders and also across multiple treatments so i think most of you are probably aware of the notion that we're currently in a one-size-fits-all psychiatry uh, even uh, with more modern uh, techniques such as rtms uh, we still do an intake we assess someone we conclude that someone is a treatment resistant depression, uh, but still we apply like a one size fits all approach. We apply TMS and everyone that walks in the door uh, with such a kind of, um, uh, kind of diagnosis. And of course, where we want to go to and where all the uh, research focuses on nowadays is to a precision psychiatry. And with precision psychiatry, uh, that basically promises to take individual level data, including genetics, including brain imaging, and also to be able to then individualize the treatment to the individual. While I think it's still a very laudable approach, I think uh, there's a couple of practical caveats with it, and I think that's best summarized in this study. Uh, I think many people are probably uh, aware of this study by Drysdale and uh, Liston Connor, uh, where I think they've taken a really sophisticated approach to MRI imaging, and by taking over 1,000 MRI scans uh, from patients, from depressed patients, uh, and a very sophisticated approach, they were able to derive four different biotypes. The biotypes, to some degree, also mapped onto domains such as anhedonia or anxiety, but they really were really uh, in a data-driven fashion derived from the MRI scans. 
Not only were these four biotypes uh, discovered in a statistical manner, but it was also demonstrated, as we can see here, that when you look at TMS response, that biotype 1 and biotype 3 were very responsive to uh, dorsal medial prefrontal TMS, whereas biotype 2 and 4 uh, were much less responsive to treatment. So according to some people, this looks like almost like a perfect biomarker. And often people would state you need like an 80% sensitivity and specificity. And so especially biotype 1 uh, would be pretty close to meeting such statistical thresholds. But then my question always is like, okay, if this biotype approach is really something we start implementing in clinical practice, what happens if your patient walks in, uh, but instead of a biotype number one, it returns biotype two or four? Is that then enough of a reason to then start denying this patient uh, the treatment of TMS? And I think uh, the honest answer for most clinicians out there will be no, because we see that there's still a 20 to 25 percent likelihood of achieving response. Knowing that we're dealing with a treatment resistant patient, that could still be a sufficient uh, likelihood of response that you might not want to withhold the treatment. And we have to remember that, that su uh, suicidal risk is a very big risk factor in depression. And so it is a potentially life threatening disease. And therefore, I think withholding a treatment based on a biomarker is not something that we are ready for yet in clinical practice. And those are, I think, the ethical dilemmas that we're faced with uh, when we start thinking about implementing a biomarker into clinical practice. So until the moment that we have discovered uh, an alternative to offer the people that return as a biotype two and four, I don't think that in clinical practice we can start implementing a biomarker, no matter how strong the uh, sensitivity specificity will be for biotype one and maybe biotype three. So I hope that that really gels with you guys, that, you, that that makes sense, uh, because that's really where we also come in with the stratified psychiatry approach, uh, which really is about stratifying to an always evidence-based treatment, uh, so not having not requiring off-label treatment, uh, but still increasing the likelihood of ind individual patients to respond. So here we see the landscape of, uh, of all antidepressant treatments, and I could draw up a similar kind of figure for ADHD and possibly for other treatments as well. And here uh, you can look up the, the, the references if you want in, in the article that we published on this called uh, Stratified Psychiatry. Uh, but we've taken the most impressive data sources that we could find. And here, for example, the meta-analysis by Pim Kuipers, here the uh, Bloomberger trial, uh, here the iSpot trial, uh, and this is the STAR-D trial. So what you can see if you glance across all the treatments, and we see response and remission percentages per treatment, then we can see if we start out with the psychotherapies that there's no significant differences in response and remission rates between cognitive behavior therapy, intrapersonal therapy, and other types of psychotherapy. We can also see that between 10 hertz TMS and intermittent theta burst stimulation, that there's no significant difference in response remission rates as well. And we do know that from iSpot, that when we randomize people to three different antidepressants, two SSRIs and one SNRI, that the remission response rate are pretty much identical as well. Then if we know that there's no significant difference between psychotherapy and medication, then I think the conclusion can be that all the treatments on the group level, and this is again from the one size fits all approach, are not statistically superior or inferior to one another. So let's now do this thought experiment. Let's now assume that I'm a clinician. If I were to randomize patients by using the dice and assign a patient to one of these treatments, I think the thought experiment here is, would I do any harm in patients? And let's not factor in costs uh, and stuff like that, but mainly focus on response remission. And I think the conclusion uh, will probably be that we cannot do harm uh, because the likelihood of response and remission is likely going to be identical between these treatments. Therefore, what we are advocating for is to simply replace the dice by a biomarker. Because if even if our biomarker is wrong, we will still end up uh, with an effective treatment that is still effective from the one-size-fits-all perspective. But if our biomarker is somewhat predictive, uh, favoring one treatment for one individual or another treatment for another individual, we will always gain some level of remission rates uh, into re in, in respective patients. And so that's really what we uh, mean with the term stratified psychiatry.
we cannot individualize the treatment yet to the n equals one individual, but we can identify uh, subgroups within our patient population that are preferentially responsive to TMS, to psychotherapy, uh, to ketamine, antidepressants, or any other treatment. And so even, while we might not be hitting the 80 to 90% sensitivity specificity, we are increasing the relative likelihood uh, of someone's response. And knowing that our, a patient will always end up with an effective treatment, we will not be withholding an active treatment to a patient based on a biomarker. And this fundamental difference in thinking, in my view, makes this really something that could be utilized in clinical practice already. And that's exactly what we're doing at this point in time already. So just to orient you a little bit on, uh, on the history we've had, um, I mean, my PhD was on the topic of personalized medicine. A long time ago, I was still na naive enough to think that that would be the way forward uh, that we could start implementing it. Uh, after my PhD, uh, the iSpot trial uh, was finalized and I thought, well, now we finally get to test all the hypotheses we have on the largest biomarker study to date. So in this study, we collected over a thousand patients with depression that were all randomized to three different treatments, either acetalopram, sertraline, or fenlafaxine. Uh, and we also collected data on about over 300 uh, healthy controls. Data was collected in 20 international clinical sites. And you see we had two sites in the Netherlands that we were involved in, but there were also many, many sites across the US, Australia, New Zealand, and South Africa. So we've been publishing quite a string of, uh, of studies on this. Eh? We, there was a lot of data collected, including EEG, but also MRI. And we've mainly been focusing on the EEG results from this study. And even though much more is published, uh, I'm trying to summarize our main findings in this slide, uh, which might be a bit information dense, but I'll try to take you through it. Um, so there's a couple of major findings that stood out to my big surprise. Um, to begin with, I think the most powerful predictor that we have discovered uh, was frontal alpha symmetry. And this basically tells you a little bit about if alpha is more dominant right frontal versus left frontal. This hypothesis has been um, posited as a kind of diagnostic metric long time ago. But mind you, we did not find any difference in frontal alpha symmetry between healthy controls and depressed patients. So it was not useful at all uh, as a diagnostic uh, measure confirmed by a meta-analysis that we published after that. However, what we did find with the sample size, we were also able to factor in sex as a main factor. And so we did not co-vary for being male or female, uh, but we also included sex as a main factor, but we, by we could inspect potential interactions between the biomarker and treatment res response that were qualitatively different for males and females. And as a matter of fact, we find that across the board in ADHD, as well as depression, that the most powerful predictors we find usually only work in males or in females. And so I think it's a first take home lesson as well. If you're interested in doing research, always verify if the biomarker that you find uh, is qualitatively different between males and females eh, in a kind of post hoc analysis or a priori analysis. So here we found, for example, that only in females, those patients that had a relative right frontal alpha were more likely to respond to the SSRIs acetalopram and sertraline, but we did not find such an effect for fenlafaxine nor for RTMS. But you can also see if there was left frontal dominance of alpha, that the likelihood of remitting or responding to an SSRI was significantly diminished. And we can see the effect size, which I think for a sample size like this is quite a strong effect size. So with this kind of a, a figure, you could already start hypothesizing, okay, that's interesting. So if you would have like a positive value, that means we should assign you to an SSRI. So, but if you would have a negative value and knowing that you have a lower likelihood of remitting, by the lack of a significant effect, we might better trial you on fenlafaxine or maybe RTMS, but it's a different discussion. But let's go with the thought of fenlafaxine. So actually, when we did that simulation on paper, not factoring in age or other uh, demographic factors, we found that the remission rate, uh, the randomized remission rate was 46%, would have improved to about 60% if we would simply have assigned people based on this biomarker. And so I think this demonstrates the, the concept of stratification, that you can stratify between 
an S and SNRI and an SSRI simply based on the EEG and already enhance clinical efficacy and still get everyone get to treat everyone. In a second large study, uh, we collaborated with Nash Boutros, and Nash Boutros is uh, both a neurologist as well as a psychiatrist, uh, and he individually classified all the 1,500 EEGs that we collected with iSpot. So he then um, uh, made classifications into inter, uh, interictal or epileptiform discharges, and he also classified their alpha peak frequency. So we had an a priori hypothesis that even though all the patients did not meet criteria for epilepsy, there could still be some levels of epileptiform discharges in their brain activity that would not translate in, into uh, convulsive seizures and stuff like that, but could be explaining to some degree their depressive, depressive symptoms. And therefore, if you would treat them with a standard SSRI or SNRI, we hypothesized they would be showing a lower likelihood of response. That's exactly what we found. We find that those people with epileptiform EEG activity were about three times less likely to respond or respond uh, to escitalopram and fenlafaxine. What was interesting, however, was that even though there was no significant effect, there was an opposite trend for sertraline. And when we then zoom in on alpha peak frequency, we found a significant effect for sertraline that the slower your alpha peak frequency was, the more likely you would be to respond. And a slow alpha frequency can be considered a more or less a sign of abnormality as well. And so a very simple story here, we not find a drug class specific effect, but a drug specific effect. And on rereading re the literature, we know that even though sertraline is an SSRI, it also has more dopaminergic affinity and has some differences relative to escitalopram, and that might explain uh, this, this different response profile and might infer it to be mild anticonvulsant, uh, might have, might have anticonvulsant properties as well. In a follow-up study, we actually demonstrated that uh, when we look at the EEG from baseline to eight weeks of treatment, that those patients that were treated with sertraline, and if they normalized their EEG, meaning they no longer would have epileptiform discharges, uh, that that would mediate the clinical response to, to the antidepressant as well. And so I think it's a very interesting kind of notion that sertraline uh, could be reclassified as a kind of anticonvulsant in the treatment of depression as well. So these, I think, I mean, beyond many other predictors that we've investigated and, and looked at, and we found these to be the strongest predictors that we had. So we've also taken these into a kind of prospective study. And I think this is the first prospective feasibility trial uh, where we actually, in a large clinic, used a very simplistic decision tree. And I think you can see that over here, that in case of EEG abnormalities, we would assign people to sertraline prospectively. Then the males that would be left over would be assigned to escitalopram. And for the females, we would then use frontal alpha symmetry to assign them between the SSRI and the SNRI. So even though it was just powered as a feasibility trial with the main question, uh, would psychiatrists really follow recommendations um, uh, from the EEG? And the very simple answer there is yes, they were very enthusiastic and it worked very well. We could also find, which we had not expected, that there was a significant difference between treatment as usual, and the patient that the psychiatrists uh, were prescribing the treatment as they always did, uh, switching that, that whole practice to EEG informed. And we, we can see that the change in depressive symptoms was significantly stronger in the EEG informed group. And we could almost conclude it was almost a doubling uh, of the remission rate between the two groups. And so this is something that we're currently following up, but also demonstrates that, that we can already implement this in practice and since we're using this stratified psychiatry approach. So that really pushed us further, like we, there were some uh, differences in calculations of alpha frequency, for example, we've done between studies. And therefore, uh, our PhD, Helena Vettel, has been focusing on on yeah, validating this much further and refining uh, the, the way we calculate alpha frequency and other uh, EEG par parameters in more detail. So to that means we have been uh, utilizing the largest data set that we uh, could find and that's our TD Brain Plus data set. I'll show you a bit more about TD Brain later. And here we have almost 5,000 uh, individuals that were tested in our clinics and clinics of colleagues over the last 20 years. 
Um, and here we see basically the whole scatter plot separately for males and females. And remember uh, that we uh, that we always will stratify between males and females. And you can also tell that the trajectory across age of alpha frequency is quite significantly different between males and females. So the first thing we did is we tested about over 100 different permutations. So you can calculate alpha frequency using a two second segment, a three second, four, five, six, seven, uh, up to eight second segments. And of course, the, 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 the longer the segment length, the higher the frequency resolution of an alpha frequency. But there's an optimum uh, for that. So that's one of the permutations. And we looked at different montages, uh, linked tiers, average reference, uh, Laplacian montages. And so there were multiple ways of calculating alpha frequency. And by looking at this ground truth scenario, because we know that alpha frequency matures with age, we looked at which of the permutations was most biologically plausible, meaning uh, which one would explain most of the variance, especially in the younger ages. And that is the permutation that we picked going forward. Then what we did as a next level is that we were flattening the curve. It was COVID time, so that was very timely in those times. Um, so we, we calculated a, a statistical model, non-parametric model for males and females separately. We then normalized the data and calculated divergence scores. And based on that, we calculated someone's individual score against uh, this model uh, and derived from that uh, a D style score for interpretability. And so in the end, after all these permutations and based on over 4,000 people, uh, this is the, the biomarker and the way we visualize it. And so we can have a low voltage alpha marker. That means that someone doesn't have any low, any alpha. So if you don't have alpha, uh, then probably it's, you can't score it and you cannot derive its frequency. We have then uh, 10 D cells uh, and the, depending on your age and sex, uh, you will get an individualized score anywhere uh, in between these, uh, these scores. So this is what we've then, then developed. And then the next question was, okay, but if we now start validating this in a clinical manner, uh, will it predict something? Uh, so here we've taken two data sets that we have been working with for a long time. This is the iSpot A uh, it's the trial, the largest biomarker trial in ADHD, where kids were prescribed with methylphenidate. And there we find that if you have a normal or faster alpha frequency, uh, then you would be more likely to respond. And we've also observed that in your feedback treatment, that if you have that you would respond better uh, with the opposite if you have a slower alpha frequency. So here we've then taken the d cell scores and simply assigned people to methylphenidate when they had high scores. And when they had low scores, they would be assigned to, metal, to neurofeedback. And then we see that the, that, the, that the remission rates would have improved by 17% for methylphenidate and plus 30% for neurofeedback. So then the question is, well, this we cannot rely on clinically. We need to have this validated independently. So therefore, we, uh, we conducted blinded out of sample validations, uh, which was quite courageous of, uh, of, of my PhD, Helena, to, uh, to consider that, because if it would have returned a negative value, uh, we might have had a big bit of a problem publishing it, obviously. So we got independent EEG data out of UCLA from Sandra Lou, and also from the ICANN neurofeedback study from the US. And Helena made the predictions in a blinded fashion uh, by only knowing the EEG and someone's age and sex. And then an external colleague would validate it. And so this was really blind to any of the outcomes. So this is what the results showed. And we actually show an almost better validation accuracy uh, of plus 30% for methylphenidate and a plus of 29% for neurofeedback. And so I think a very strong and powerful replication uh, knowing that we can stratify between these two treatments. We did a further exploration for guanfacine and atomoxetine, and even while those need to be further replicated, it's interesting to note that atomoxetine is actually showing the same directionality of the effect as neurofeedback. And so for those people uh, that don't have access to neurofeedback or might not want to consider neurofeedback, you could even uh, use this to stratify between methylphenidate versus atomoxetine. And knowing that both are indicated and FDA approved for the treatment of ADHD, uh, you might still improve your relative remission rates by stratifying between those two. So next question is, well, does the same brain marker that I just showed also work in depression? 
and reminding you of the notion that we saw that sertraline, and that if you have a lower alpha frequency, you are more likely to respond. And so we did a first blinded out of sample validation in the MBARC trial. And the MBARC trial, I think, is the, the largest double blind placebo controlled biomarker study in depression, where they randomized almost 300 patients to placebo or sertraline. And interestingly, when we did a blinded out of sample, we don't see anything for placebo. It has a plus and a minus of 3%, which I think is negligible. But we see for sertraline that indeed when we assign people with low scores to sertraline, that they have a 9% higher remission that actually increases further to a plus of 15%. And so I think this, this replicates and demonstrates that indeed the sertraline group um, is preferentially responsive if people would start with a, a relatively slow alpha frequency to begin with. So this is another piece of work that, uh, that was published by Andrew Leuchter and colleagues out of UCLA. They actually described as the first ones that if your endogenous alpha frequency is closer to 10 hertz and subsequently you get treated with 10 hertz RTMS, that you're more likely to, uh, to respond to treatment. So we found this a really interesting study, so we worked with them to replicate it, and here you can see the outcome, that indeed for everyone that underwent 10 hertz TMS, indeed the, the data fit will tell you that exactly what they predicted, that the closer you are to 10 hertz, the higher uh, the symptom change, uh, the, the fewer symptoms you will have from pre to post treatment when you assess it as at baseline. And when your alpha frequency increases, it also tapers off. And so this opens up the possibility that we might be looking at a synchronization effect for RTMS, and whereby uh, you need to take into account somehow your endogenous alpha frequency in relationship uh, to your uh, TMS frequency. What's really exciting here is that when, when we did the same analysis for one hertz right-sided TMS, which is a protocol we very often use, we could not find this association. So I think you're probably starting to get an impression like where I'm trying to get at. Like indeed, we need to now stratify patients for depression with RTMS uh, to 10 Hertz TMS if their alpha frequency is relatively close to 10 Hertz. So that's what this frontal synchronization marker entails. If this light bulb is switched on, it tells you that someone's alpha frequency is very close to 10 Hertz. So when we assign those patients to 10 hertz TMS, you effectively gain 29% in remission rate, which I think is a really clinically relevant uh, improvement that you can achieve by stratifying with this approach. Then the question is, okay, so that's nice, but what do we do with the one hertz? Well, we found that the people that have high DSAL scores uh, relative to methylphenidate for ADHD in the analogy, if you assign them to one hertz, you will gain 14%. But again, we need to do a blinded out of sample validation. So what does the blinded out of sample validation show? Well, plus of 16%. And so again, a perfect replication in an independent sample that, uh, that with high DSAL scores, uh, people can be assigned the best to one hertz RTMS. So now the question is, well, okay, now we still have the low DSAL scores. So what happens and what is the treatment? And we should prescribe those patients that fall into the low DSAL scores. Well, when patients, uh, we, of course, we saw that sertraline would be an option, uh, but knowing that we're dealing here with treatment-resistant patients, um, and we know that we might not want to trial them again on sertraline. So the one other treatment that in this category will be left is electroconvulsive therapy. And indeed, we find that when we look at data that was kindly shared by the Rheinstaaten Hospital, that, we, that those people with a slow D, low D cell score uh, benefit more from electroconvulsive therapy. So again, can we replicate it? So this is an independent data set from uh, Sebastian Olbrich out, out of Zurich that nicely replicates uh, that there's a higher remission rate associated with people with low D cell scores. The interesting aspect here is that we also had side effect ratings, which we know is a very important aspect in electroconvulsive therapy. And we also found that those people that were most likely to respond with a low D-cell score were also those patients to have significantly fewer side effects. So not only are we selecting those patients that are more likely to remit, but also with the fewer side effects associated to it. And so here, I think we've shown that 
And you, in a three-way fashion, we can now stratify treatment-resistant patients uh, to all kinds of different treatments. So when we then simulate this across all the data that I just presented and which are hundreds of patients, then we see that if we would have stratified every individual patient to the right treatment, and that you would have gained 24% in remission across the whole group. And I think that's indeed a very interesting uh, and clinically relevant uh, way going forward. I mean, this would be a number needed to treat of four. And we know that many treatments even have a number needed to treat that are much higher. So knowing that we can optimize the treatments, uh, knowing that we're talking about active treatments by just using a biomarker, I think we're really faced with something clinically meaningful here that can be applied in clinical practice. So we've also out of, did some additional testing on psychotherapy, ketamine, and bupropion. Uh, so uh, we can't predict everything, uh, which would be realistic, obviously. Uh, so for ketamine and bupropion, uh, we did not find any predictive capabilities. Uh, but actually for psychotherapy, uh, we do find that low d cell scores are predictive of psychotherapy, uh, but that we still need to do a, an out-of-sample validation for. So summarizing uh, the whole brain marker platform that we've developed here, we can see brain marker one. That's an important one in this platform. And here you can see how different treatments will map onto this single brain marker that we've depicted here. The synchronization marker is an indication for 10 Hertz TMS. Then we see psychotherapy, certainly in an electroconvulsive therapy relative to someone's treatment resistant level associated with low D cell scores. We see venlafaxine, uh, escitalopram, and 1 hertz TMS uh, for the higher D-cell scores. We've also seen that brain marker 2, which actually is the frontal alpha symmetry uh, brain marker, and that in case of females, we can assign to SNRI or to an SSRI. And these biomarkers are currently in development for the application of neurofeedback and individualizing treatment there. So with that, I hope that I've convinced you that, um, uh, that we've seen this whole family of antidepressant treatments. And rather than relying on the dice or a random assignment to one of these treatments, uh, we can use a single or maybe two brain markers uh, to already improve relative permission rates uh, across these treatments with a number needed to treat of about four. So for those of you who are interested in this research, um, we know that replication uh, and the replication crisis is not something that's confined to social psychology. Uh, we know that in biological psychology and neuroscience, it's also a bit problematic. And we've experienced this ourselves that uh, three of the biomarkers that were in my PhD, I was not able to replicate them in a future independent data set. Therefore, we've decided uh, to share all the EEGs that we've collected ourselves. Uh, over the last two decades in the two decades brain clinics research archive or the TD brain database. It's been published in scientific data as a data descriptor. It contains more than 1200 EEGs, uh, resting states, we have audible data available on request, and it has very rich phenotype data. And so we have treatment response, we have diagnostic data on ADHD, OCD, Parkinson, multiple disorders. Uh, so feel free to use it. There's only one caveat. We also have a leaderboard on our website. About 30% of the data is blanked out as replication, which means that we also want to help you and facilitate you do the out of blinded out of sample validation. So if you have a perfect algorithm that can identify a depression or ADHD from the EEG, or can identify TMS treatment response or neurofeedback treatment response, please share your predictions with us. We will then, blind, in a blinded fashion, uh, uh, to inform you about your uh, success of, uh, of predicting it and we'll include it in the website so you can also point reviewers to the fact that an independent party has independently out of sample validated uh, your results. And so we also hope to increase the standards and also hopefully increase the speed by which uh, new biomarkers can be developed and implemented in practice because that's the only purpose that we want to serve, have more patients benefit from treatment more quickly uh, and with a higher likelihood. With that, I think I've summarized this pretty much, and I think this message has become clear. Uh, but I especially want to thank uh, all the colleagues that we work with, uh, especially uh, Hanneke van Dijk, who's been much of the processing and the TD Brain work. Helena has been doing much of the 
brain marker one work, um, several colleagues of Schneider that collected the data, uh, but especially also the many people listed here. And we could not have done this work without colleagues that are willing and open-minded enough to share EEG data, even in a blinded fashion. And so we're really thankful of people sharing data. I would encourage everyone to consider it as well. Uh, it's really, really rewarding and it will really bring uh, our EEG field uh, to a better and quicker future.